So let's move in here into chapter 12. This chapter is all about real estate financing. And, you know, if you took our real estate principles class, you know, we have a pretty thorough discussion in chapters eight and nine about financing. And uh, a lot of this might be a little bit of a review for you, but it's important nonetheless. Now, why do you think there are financing chapters, not only in real estate principles, but also in real estate practice and real estate law? And, you know, if you're taking your broker's class, we're, we have a lot of, uh, we have a whole class really on real estate finance that's required by the BRE in California. And if you think about it, the majority of all of our real estate transactions actually have an element of finance in them. The majority of transactions that we're dealing with actually, you know, the buyer isn't paying cash for the property. They're securing a loan from either a bank or from uh, a mortgage company or from even a private individual. So before we totally get into this, let's look at the bottom of page number 400 and the top of page 401. We'll talk a little bit here about the Federal Reserve Bank. And the Federal Reserve Bank is our nation's bank in, uh, throughout the United States. And really there's two ways that the government could influence how our economy grows. One way is through uh, fiscal policy. And fiscal policy is like through tax and spend. Fiscal policy is where uh, you know, the federal government either raises or lowers tax rates in order to influence our economy. Now that's different than monetary policy. And if you look at the bottom of page number 400 and the top of page 401, these two pages really talk about monetary policy that the Federal Reserve uses to influence the overall economy. Now, three things at the top of page 401 that the Fed could do to influence the economy. Number one is the discount rate. Now, the discount rate is the rate that the Federal Reserve will charge member banks for short, very short-term borrowing. Now, don't confuse this with the prime rate. The prime rate, of course, is, where, is the rate that the bank might charge its best customer. But the discount rate, totally different. This is the rate that the Federal Reserve Bank charges member banks to borrow money. Now, all three of these, really, if you look at the top of page 401, all three of these are either going to have an um, effect of stimulating the economy or of slowing the economy. So right next to discount rate at the top of page 401, you might want to write the word slow. So if, you, if we want to slow the economy, we would raise the discount rate. So if the government wanted to slow the economy, maybe they thought inflation was on the horizon, they would uh, raise the discount rate. So clearly, if it costs more money to borrow money, people are less likely to want to borrow it, right? So if we raise the discount rate, this will have the effect of slowing the economy. If we lower the discount rate, this will have the effect of stimulating the economy. So if we lower and lower and lower rates, you know, people might be more app to borrow because it's cheaper to borrow money. When they borrow money, they go out and spend it and it grows the economy. So one way that the Federal Reserve could influence our economy is through uh, monetary policy and the discount rate. If we lower the discount rate, this would have the effect of stimulating the economy. If we raise the discount rate, this would have the effect of slowing the economy. And you might want to make that note here at the top of page 401. The second way that the Federal Reserve could influence our economy is through reserve requirements. Now, reserve requirements, of course, are the amount of money that a member bank has to have in reserve according to the Federal Reserve. So if I'm Wells Fargo Bank and I have $100 in my vault, I actually cannot loan out all that 100 I have to keep a certain amount of that 100 in reserve. Now, that amount is actually dictated by the Federal Reserve Bank. As a member bank, I got to follow their rules. So if we raise the reserve requirement, Let's say the reserve requirement is raised from 14% to 25%. Now, the bank has less money to lend out. If they have less money to lend out, this is going to have the effect of slowing the economy because there's not, there's, not there's not enough money to lend out. If we lowered the reserve requirement, this would have the effect of stimulating the economy. So instead of the reserve requirements, let's say at 14%, we drop them to 5%. Now the bank only has to keep 5% in reserve. This is going to have the effect of stimulating the economy because there's more money to lend, the more money to lend, the more money is out there, and the economy is going to grow. So two ways that the Federal Reserve could influence uh, the economy through monetary policy. One way is through the discount rate. Another way is through reserve requirements here at the top of page 401. In both of these instances, if we lower the discount rate or lower the reserve requirement, this is going to have the effect of stimulating the economy. If we raise the discount rate or raise reserve requirements, this is going to have the effect of slowing the economy. If we raise the discount rate, it's more expensive to borrow. People don't want to borrow as much. 
If we raise reserve requirements, this is also going to have the effect of having less money to lend, and therefore the economy is going to slow because there's less money kind of flowing through the system. The third and final way here at the top of page 401 that the Federal Reserve could influence the economy through monetary policy is through something called open market operations. Now, the first two, we had the choice of raising or lowering, right? We had the choice of up or down. With open market operations, this is actually different. It's not going to be up or down. This is actually going to be buy or sell. So these are the purchase or sale of government bonds. Now, think about this for a second. What's a bond? A bond is like debt, right? So if I'm the government and I issue a bunch of bonds, I'm basically borrowing money from investors. I'm basically giving out a bunch of IOUs. Investors are paying me money for those IOUs. And I'm basically going to go out and do whatever I need to do, build a bridge, build a freeway, build a park. You know, I have, I have money now. Now, I've got to pay interest on those bonds, though, to those investors. So think about this for a second. If you're a member of the public and I'm the government and you have a bond in your pocket, it's not like you could go out and go to Ralph's or Trader Joe's and spend that bond money. You got to convert that bond into cash before you can go out and spend it. That's why, quite frankly, if a lot of people had all their money in bonds and never spent it, the economy would actually slow, right? Because everybody's saving, everybody's just sitting there with their cash. They're not spending it, causing the economy to grow. So think about this for a second. Let's say that I'm the government and I came to you and I bought your bond. So I'm going to give you cash and I'm going to take the bond from you. If the government buys your bond, now you're going to have money in your pocket. You can go out there and you know, spend it and grow the economy. So right next to open market operations or open market transactions, I would write the words buy bonds dash stimulate. If the government buys bonds, this would have the effect of stimulating the economy because I'm coming to you, I'm taking a bond from your pocket, I'm buying it from you. And now you can go out and spend that money that you just got from the government when I bought your bond. So buying bonds would stimulate the economy because the government is converting those bonds into cash. Now, right underneath that at the top of page 401, I would write the word sell bonds slash slow. Sell bonds slash slow. If you sell bonds, this is going to have the effect of slowing the economy. So if I'm the government and I sell you a bond, I'm basically taking money from you and I'm giving you a bond in return. Now you're forced to save. You're going to sit there with the bond and wait for it to mature or you know, live on the small coupon payments or whatever. But if I'm selling a bond and I'm the government, this is going to have the effect of slowing the economy because it's taking money out of the system and it's forcing you to sit there with your bond. So buy bonds would stimulate the economy. Sell bonds would slow the economy because it takes money out of the system. So those are three ways, just kind of uh, you know, a basic explanation, but three ways that the Federal Reserve, through monetary policy, can influence the economy. Not through fiscal policy. Right? Remember, fiscal is tax and spend. As it says here at the bottom of page 400, monetary policy are the three ways at the top of page 401. Either discount rate, up or down. That's the rate that the Federal Reserve charges a member bank for short-term borrowing. We also have number two, reserve requirements. This is the amount of money that a given bank needs to have in reserve in order to meet Federal Reserve requirements. And number three, of course, we have open market operations, which is basically the buying and selling of government bonds. So here on page number 401 at the middle, uh, there's a discussion, of course, about interest rates and the real estate market. And, you know, it's now 2014 and interest rates, of course, uh, continue to remain low. And we know that the Federal Reserve Chairman uh, Janet Yellen is uh, intimating that you know rates are going to continue to stay low over at least the next year. But what's interesting is that you know rates are again extremely low. You know in the low four percent, uh, you can get a thirty-year fixed conforming loan. But you know I read this very funny blog. Somebody sent it to me that said you know when the real estate when the, when interest rates hit seven percent, you know the real estate market is going to just completely implode. And I read that and I was like, this is obviously somebody who's like less than 25 years old. Because if you go back historically, let's say to 1979, 80, 81, 82, you know, interest rates in that, you know, Carter Reagan transition period in the early 80s really were like, you know, up in the high teens, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 percent in some cases for home loan financing. So, I mean, I think we've just been really spoiled over the last 15, 10, 15 years with interest rates, you know, four, five, six, six and a half percent. And it's, that's kind of, we've been conditioned that interest rates sort of should be in that range for real estate financing. And we've really been blessed 
by having a pretty low interest rate environment over the last decade, decade and a half. But if you look here at the bottom of page 401, there's also a discussion here, top, bottom of 401 and the top of 402 about loan points. And you know, this is important for the exam. One loan, one point, as they say, is equivalent to 1% of the loan amount. So if you have a loan of 500,000 and the lender is charging you one point, that's gonna be uh, $500,000 in uh, points. $400,000 loan, $4,000 if they're charging you one point. Now points can take one of two forms. Points can either be called origination points or they could be called discount points. Now either way, these are one point is 1% 1 of the loan amount. Now, if you look at the top of 402, a discount point is a point that is paid by the borrower in advance up front uh, in order to lower the overall interest rate. That's called a discount point. So you pay a point, a 1% of the loan amount as a discount point. This is just gonna lower your overall rate of interest on your loan. Now, if you think about this though, if I was gonna buy a home that I wanted to live in forever and rates were pretty low today and I you know, wanted a, a, a low overall interest rate over the life of the loan, let's say the entire 30 years, I might be willing to pay one or two discount points all the way maybe to some floor where I, even if I pay more, it can't go below that because I know I'm gonna be keeping this thing for let's say that I might plan anyways to keep it for let's say 30 years. If you're buying a house to flip or you're getting financing and you plan on getting in and out in the next year or two years, you're probably not gonna wanna pay a, a ton of discount points because you're gonna be selling that property and paying off that loan pretty quickly here. So this is kind of overall mortgage planning in your own mind. You know, a borrower who is likely to keep their home for an extended period of time might be willing to pay more in discount points to get an overall lower interest rate over the life of the loan. An origination point here at the top of page 402, an origination point is a point that's paid up front. It's like processing, it's just a, almost like a commission, it's just a fee paid to the, let's say, mortgage broker or lender uh, in order to obtain that loan. So either way, whether you're talking about discount points or origination points, one point is equivalent to 1% of the loan amount. Now here at the bottom of page 402, you'll see this discussion uh, where it says sources of funds where money comes from to finance real estate. Now, this money can come from essentially one of two places, and we'll talk about this again more later in the chapter, but the money can come from either an institutional lender or from a non-institutional lender, institutional or non-institutional. And we'll talk about the differences uh, later on in the chapter, but institutional lenders are like banks, life insurance companies, savings and loan organizations. Those are institutional lenders. Non-institutional lenders are like mortgage companies, private individuals, mortgage brokers, mortgage bankers. These are all considered to be non-institutional lenders. Now, uh, there's a lot more origination coming from the institutional side, mainly because banks and life insurance companies, banks do a lot of different kinds of loans. Life insurance companies generally make really big loans, like $3 million and up. Now, when you talk about a loan being originated initially, that is known as activity at the top of page 403 in the primary mortgage market. So the primary mortgage market is the original or the initial origination of a loan. That's called activity in the primary mortgage market. Now, so you go to Wells Fargo to apply for a loan, Wells Fargo uh, does that loan for you. That's activity in the primary mortgage market. The secondary market would be if Wells Fargo were to sell that loan to let's say Bank of America, that would represent activity in the secondary mortgage market. So primary mortgage market is the, origi the initial origination of the loan. The secondary mortgage market is where that loan is sold to another bank or another investor. Now, if you look here, of course, on page 403, you'll see some discussion about this. Now, a lot of people, frankly, if you look back at this last recession, you know, 2008 and 2009, a lot of people say, well, the reason that, you know, we're kind of in this, uh, the, the conundrum that we were in or the problems we were having is because a lot of the banks would just sell off these loans and they wouldn't really care whether or not the borrower could pay. You know, that's, that's true it's to, to some extent, you know, that a bank should have a little more skin in the game. If you're gonna originate a loan, you should vet that borrower and make sure they have the credit and the income necessary to, you know, continue to make payments. But the notion that, you know, a bank selling a loan to another bank is inherently evil you know, I would, I would encourage you to think about that because imagine that Wells Fargo made, let's say, a billion dollars in mortgage origination this year. Then next year, Wells Fargo has a meeting and says, you know what, 
we're way too heavy into real estate loans. We don't want to make any more real estate loans anymore. Let's, let's focus more on auto loans. Now, borrowers that come into Wells Fargo to borrow money to buy houses the next year aren't going to be able to secure financing because they're otherwise qualified. It's just that the bank doesn't want to play in that sandbox anymore because they have, you know, they've made too many loans of that type. So in order to kind of keep money flowing through the system and keep credit flowing through, our, through, through the system and make sure there's always money available for real estate loans, the government actually participates in this secondary market where these loans are purchased from other investors just to free up capital and make sure that money stays flowing through the system. You'll see these on the bottom of page 403. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are basically quasi-governmental organizations that participate in the secondary mortgage market. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac help money flow through the system by buying loans from banks that meet their underwriting guidelines. And you'll see this actually at the bottom of page 404. You'll see a couple things here. First, the term conforming loan. A conforming loan at the bottom of page 404 is a loan that meets the underwriting standards for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for purchase in the secondary market. That's why if you like, I'll give you an example. Right now I'm in uh, Newport Beach. If you look at high-end areas like Newport Beach, Manhattan Beach, Beverly Hills, a lot of transactions that are done in those communities, well, first they tend to be cash. And it's not so easy to get, a, to get a money to buy a you know, $3 million home. Mainly because these very large uh, home loans, two and a half, three, four, five, ten million dollars, there's not a lot of secondary market activity for these loans. So a lot of these loans are what's called portfolio loans here at the bottom of page 404. A portfolio loan is a loan with kind of, it is kind of what it sounds like. A portfolio loan is a loan that the lender intends to keep. A portfolio loan is a loan that the lender keeps kind of in their portfolio and uh, the lender makes the interest on that. Now here's the challenge with a lot of large jumbo loans that are uh, portfolio loans inherently, is that if a bank makes you a $4 million loan and you don't pay, that bank could be in a pretty tough position because they, it's not easily sold in the secondary market. They can't push that risk onto someone else easily, problem number one. The other thing to think about with this is that a bank could either make you one $4 million loan or they can make 10 $400,000 loans, spread their risk and get loan fees and origination fees on every one of those deals. So if the question on the exam were to say here at the bottom of 404, loans that meet underwriting guidelines for purchase by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are known as what? Your answer, conforming loans, right? A loan that the lender does not sell and intends to keep is known as what? Bottom of page 404, these are known as portfolio loans here at the bottom of page 404. Now, you ta we talked earlier about the two types of lenders. There are institutional lenders and non-institutional lenders, right? Institutional and non-institutional. Institutional lenders, if you look here on page 405, there's a couple of these that we should know for the exam. One of these are commercial banks. Next to commercial banks, I'd write a couple things. The first thing I would write at the middle of page 405, I would write the words a wide variety of loans. A commercial bank makes a wide variety of loans. I mean, isn't it true that you could go to a commercial bank and get, let's say, a credit card loan and a student loan and an auto loan and a home equity loan? I mean, there's all sorts of different loans that you could get from a bank. So a bank makes a wide variety of loans for the exam. Another thing that I would note here, if you look at page 405, I would underline or highlight kind of into the middle of the page, you'll see where it says, commercial banks have been a major source for construction loans. So if the question on the exam were to say, the lender that would most likely make you a construction loan is who? A commercial bank, right? So commercial banks are going to make construction loans and they also make a wide variety of loans here at the middle of page 405. Now these are different than if you look at page 406, these are different than life insurance companies. Next to life insurance companies, I would write the words large loans, $3 million and up. Life insurance companies make large loans, $3 million and up. So the question on the exam actually kind of might be backwards on this one. The question on the test might be the lender that would least likely make a small loan to purchase a condominium is who? That's right, life insurance companies, right? Life insurance companies are least likely to make those small loans. They'll generally make large loans, let's say $3 million and up. 
Another thing that's pretty important about life insurance companies for our test is at the bottom of the page, in bold, you'll see the term participation loan. So a participation loan is a loan wherein the lender, typically a life insurance company in this context, a lender will make you the loan, but they'll also take a small minority share in ownership in the project. So the lender might say, look, we'll make you the loan, but we also want a small equity share in the project. Now, you have to be careful though as an investor because a lot of the times when life insurance companies make these participation loans, they'll have a say in management also. So if you have a gardener friend of yours or a landscaper that's, you know, that you're pretty close with and that lender uh, says that, hey, look, this landscaper is charging too much money. It's possible that that lender might be able to dictate who you actually can use to landscape the project because they also have an equity interest in the property. So, you know, we two institutional lenders, one commercial banks, right? We know these guys make a variety of loans and they're active in construction lending. We know that. We also know that another institutional lender is a uh, life insurance company. These guys make large loans, generally $3 million and up. And some of these loans, quite frankly, are also participation loans, where the lender will take an equity interest in the project uh, in addition to making the loan. Now, one thing that's important at the bottom of page 405, one thing that's important at the bottom of 405 is the term private mortgage insurance. So private mortgage insurance, or PMI, is a monthly fee, it's insurance, that is paid when you have one loan that is greater than 80% of the value of the property. So generally what will happen here is, let's say with an FHA deal, we'll talk about FHA later in the chapter, on FHA, you're typically putting about 3.5% down on an FHA loan. So you'll have one loan that's 96.5% of the purchase price. Because now you have one loan greater than 80% of the value, the lender will, as, you're, as a borrower, you're really required to pay something called PMI or private mortgage insurance each and every month at the bottom of page 405. So again, what is PMI? It's private mortgage insurance. It's monthly premium paid because you have one loan greater than 80% of the value of the property. And that's important to know here at the bottom of page 405. Now, if you look at the bottom of 406 and the top of 407, we already talked about the two important institutional lenders for the exam. They are life insurance companies and commercial banks. And we talked about some of the characteristics associated with each one of those. If you look at the bottom of 406 and the top of 407, this section is about a non-institutional lenders. And non-institutional lenders can either take the form of mortgage bankers or mortgage brokers here at the top of 407. They're also private individuals. If you look at that chart at the top of 407, anytime you have, let's say, seller carryback financing, you, uh, that seller is acting as a non-institutional lender or a private lender at the top of 407. Now, one thing that's pretty, uh, a pretty big change, actually, that's happened over the last several years in our real estate industry is the SAFE Act. And the SAFE Act is a law that went into effect a few years ago that basically requires now that all mortgage loan originators, mortgage companies, mortgage bankers, et cetera, actually have to take a 20 hour class and an exam. And every year they have to take an eight hour renewal class under the SAFE Act. So the SAFE Act is basically a law that passed that requires that mortgage loan originators have additional, basically additional education. They have to take and pass another test. They got to renew this license every year. And anytime you get a business card from a lender, the lender, their card will always have something called an NMLS number on it. This NMLS concept stands for National Mortgage License Systems, required again here under the SAFE Act, showing that they've passed the 20 hour class, they've passed an exam, they've passed a financial health check. Now again, this law went into effect after our recession. So, you know, a lot of regulators looked at our industry and said, well, who's licensing a lot of these mortgage companies? And really what they found was that under some regulatory structures, some of the employees at those mortgage companies didn't actually need to be licensed. So we passed something called the SAFE Act, which requires that mortgage companies and people that work there need an NMLS endorsement under this law called the SAFE Act here, at the, uh, here on all of page number 407, really. 
Now, another couple things that are pretty important, if you look here at the top of 408, you'll see the term subprime lender at the top of 408. A subprime loan, as you probably know, is a loan that does not meet typical underwriting guidelines. Now, this might be because maybe you have too many expenses and your debt to income ratio is a little too high. This might be because your credit score isn't you know, above you know, 680 or 720 or 750 or whatever it is, and you might need to go to a subprime lender. So a subprime loan, these are sometimes also called Alt-A loans or loans that, you know, for people that don't really fit into the box of what a traditional bank would consider to be a perfect borrower. These are, of course, known as subprime loans here at the top of page 408. You're probably familiar with that concept. Now, if you look at the bottom of page 408 and the top of 409, you'll see the term seller carryback financing in bold. Seller carryback financing is where the seller is actually acting as a lender, where the seller is actually acting as a lender. Now, let me give you an example of this. An example of a seller carry deal might be, maybe I'm selling my house for $100,000. You wanna buy my house. Between your loan and your down payment, you're good for like 90,000. You're short 10,000. Now, if you ask me to take 90,000 on my $100,000 deal, I might tell you no. But I might say, look, you pay me the 90, I, as the seller, will carry back the remaining 10,000. Meaning that you, as the buyer, are, you're gonna make your regular mortgage payment to Bank of America, but additionally, every single month, you're gonna pay me because I'm acting as the lender on a junior loan. This is known as seller carryback financing. Now, the benefit to you is that now you get to buy my house. The benefit to me is I get to sell my house and I'll actually be secured by the property as a seller. So if you don't pay me, fine, I'll just foreclose just like any other lender would. But the benefit to me is, number one, I have a security interest in the property. So if you don't pay me, I can still foreclose. Another benefit is, if I put that $10,000 in the bank, I might get you know, 1% or 1.2% or maybe even less in terms of a rate of interest. But if I'm doing a seller carry deal, I'm gonna charge you six, six and a half or 7%. So it would give me a higher rate of return that I would get leaving my money at the bank. Another benefit, candidly, to a seller carryback deal, or another thing to think about is that I, as the seller, this isn't really a benefit, but it's just to understand how these, the dynamics of how this works. In order for this to work as a seller, I have to not need that money now. I have to not be relying on that $10,000 for any purpose. Because if I need that $10,000 now, I can't carry, right? Because I need the cash. So this is a seller carry deal, where the seller is actually acting as the lender on a transaction, and the seller is being paid a higher rate of interest than they would get, for example, if they left their money at the bank. Now, another class of non-institutional lenders is here on page number 409. It's the mortgage loan broker. Now, the mortgage loan broker isn't actually making you the loan. The mortgage loan broker is actually just introducing a lender with a borrower and collecting a commission for doing so. So for the exam, maybe next to page 409, I'm, you might want to highlight this gray box that says mortgage brokers are strictly middlemen who bring lenders and borrowers together, and that's true. Another thing about mortgage brokers that's pretty important to know for our test is I would write the words least likely to service a loan. Mortgage loan brokers are least likely to service a loan, and you might want to write that here at the top of page 409. Mortgage loan brokers aren't going to service a loan. Now, what does service alone mean? That means, let's say, collect payments, send late statements, you know, basically be a uh, point of communication between the lender and uh, the borrower during the life of the loan. Mortgage brokers aren't gonna do that, generally. They're gonna introduce a lender with a borrower, collect a commission for doing so, and they're gonna be done. So here on page number 409, mortgage loan brokers, again, they're strictly middlemen between a lender and a borrower. Now, a lot of people hear this and say, well, why would I ever go to a mortgage loan broker? They're a middleman, right? Admittedly, they're a middleman. Anytime you have a middleman in anything, they're gonna charge a fee. Isn't it better to just simply, you know, go straight to a bank? Well, maybe if I have less than perfect credit, maybe if my, maybe I'm self-employed and my tax returns are really complicated and, you know, maybe I even ran a loss last year on my business, but I have money, I got a down payment, I got good credit, uh, but my tax returns just aren't there. A mortgage broker might know someone who's willing to make a loan on terms that are not exactly the same as what a traditional bank would require. 
So there's a pretty big section in this book or very important topic that we have to go over. And it's here, if you look at page 413, types of loans, 413, 414. So we'll start at the top of page 414 with this discussion about conventional loans. So a conventional loan is a loan that does not involve the government. So I know that term conventional sounds a lot like conforming, but they're actually different. A conventional loan is a loan that does not have any government participation. Those loans are known as conventional loans. Remember, a conforming loan is a loan that meets the underwriting standards for a purchase by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in the secondary mortgage market, right? So that's a conforming loan. A conventional loan is a loan that simply does not involve any aspect of the government. Now, typically, just one way to think about this, if you look at the top of page 414, one way to think about this is, what do you consider to be good credit in your own mind? Just a credit score. Ah, a lot of people, if you ask someone that, they'll say 700, 720, 760, 800, something like that. Is 580 good credit? I think most of us would probably agree that 580 isn't the most stellar credit in the world, but a FHA loan will allow a borrower to borrow money to buy a property with you know, 580 credit. Uh, what do you consider to be a normal down payment required on a loan? Now, if you ask most people that, most people are going to say 20%. Now, think about this. If everybody on the planet needed 20% to put down, it wouldn't happen. I mean, let's say in Orange County or LA County and, or even in the Bay Area, whatever, an average price home might be 500000 or more. I mean, even if you go into like Riverside and San Bernardino counties, which are great areas, even a $300,000 property, if you needed $60,000 or 20% to buy a $300,000 property, how long do you think it would take most people to save up 60,000? It would take a long time. And for a lot of us, you know, we might not even know where to start to save up that much money. But FHA will allow a borrower to put only three and a half percent down in order to uh, buy a property FHA. Now again, do banks like making loans to people that only have three and a half percent down? Of course not. But a bank is willing to do it because on an FHA deal, the government is actually insuring the loan. So again, a conventional loan is generally going to have more strict underwriting guidelines, typically going to require, let's say, a, you know, a conventional loan, a lot of the time, 10 or 20 percent down or more. It's going to require, you know, really good credit. It's going to require you don't have a long story about your life. You know, FHA even has a program on a side note called FHA Back to Work. You can look that up on Google. FHA Back to Work allows a borrower to buy a home, FHA, within one year of a foreclosure. That's amazing. I mean, do banks like making loans to people that just foreclosed last year? Of course not. But they're okay to do it on this particular program because FHA is insuring the lender. So again, a conventional loan, top of page 414, is a loan that doesn't involve the government at all. If you look at page number 414, you'll see this gray box. Remember, this is a real estate practice class. So it's kind of the practical application of real estate, how to compare loans. Look at the things that we're recommending you compare loans on. Loan to value ratio, the ratio or LTV, the ratio of the loan amount to the value of a property. How much money do you need to put down in order to, uh, to secure the loan? That's uh, one thing to compare. Look at the second thing, interest rate, and can it be changed? Is it fixed or adjustable? Look at the third thing, loan costs and fees required. We'll talk about this again, but uh, there's a law called RESPA, or the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, and RESPA actually requires that a uh, lender provide a borrower with something called a good faith estimate of all the fees, right? So you can compare apples to apples within three business days of you applying for a loan. Prepayment penalties, you know, is, are you gonna be paying a big fee to pay off the loan early if you sell it or refinance it? Look at the next one, length of the loan. Is it a 15 year or a 30 year loan? Amount of fixed monthly payment, right? I mean, how much is the payment comparing apples to apples? Initial rate, adjustment periods, caps, index, all these things, if you have an adjustable rate loan, need to be compared. So, you know, it's important. Buying the right home is important. But almost as important, and in some instances, maybe even more important, is the financing structure that you choose on your particular, uh, on your particular loan. Now, remember, a conventional loan, top of 414, is a loan that doesn't involve the government. At the bottom of page 414, a government loan is not conventional by definition, obviously, because a conventional loan is a loan that doesn't involve the government. A government loan is, it involves the government, right? And there's really three types. If you look at page 415, you'll see this chart, FHA, VA, and CalVet. FHA, VA, and CalVet are the three types of government-sponsored loan types 
that are important for us to know on the exam. Now, if you look here at the bottom of page number 414, bottom of 415, you'll see the term FHA. FHA, of course, is Federal Housing Administration. And, you know, we have a few paragraphs here on this, but I just, I'll just give you the gist of what FHA is. First of all, FHA is not, for, not only for first-time buyers. You can buy your second house FHA. It's just that uh, most people that go FHA tend to be first-time home buyers because FHA only requires a 3.5% down payment which makes home ownership possible for people that don't necessarily have a home before that they're selling to buy their next one. Because a lot of the time, if you own a home already and you sell it, you're going to use that down payment in order to buy the next one, right? So you're not going to need the 3.5% down payment that FHA, that benefit that FHA provides to an FHA borrower. But do you have to be a first-time buyer to go FHA? No. Are most FHA loans originated for first-time buyers? Probably. FHA is only going to require a 3.5% down payment. Now, FHA loan limits are dependent on which county you're buying the property in. Now, the book here on page 415 uh, says at the middle, FHA insured has a max loan amount of 625. That's actually dependent on the county. If you look at LA and Orange County, for example, uh, the FHA loan limit around here is up to about 729,000 and change, which is great news. I mean, Again, I mean, today I'm in Newport Beach, but you're probably not going to buy the home of your dreams in Newport Beach for $729,000. But there are some areas in Orange County where you can get maybe not the biggest house on the block, but you could get a really nice house and only put 3.5% down on your FHA deal. So you can buy a $700,000 home and only put you know, $24,000, $25,000 down. That $300,000 property I talked about, let's say in Ontario, California, you know, you can buy that property with $11,000 down or about 3.5%. Now, you can save up $11,000, maybe not in a day, maybe not in a week, maybe not even in a year. But you could say, you know what, I'm going to buy a house in two years and I'm going to go FHA, I'm going to buy it in the city and I'm only going to put 3.5% down. That's possible, right? If you needed to save up $60,000, you can't just cut out beer, chocolate and cigarettes and get to, you know, $60,000. It's going to take a lot, it's a hell of a lot longer road to save up that much money. So FHA, the benefit here is that it only requires a 3.5% down payment. VA, on the other hand, if you look at page number 416, VA is awesome. Now, VA is only for veterans, but VA is awesome because it requires no money down. So when we, we talked earlier about this concept of something called loan to value, loan to value ratio is a ratio of the loan amount to the value of a property, right? On our, if you're putting no money down, what's your loan to value? 100% loan to value on that on, on VA on page number 416. Now you do have to have a certificate of eligibility that shows that you're entitled to veterans benefits, but you know you should be. You've served our country and you're going to be able to put zero down and buy a home. So we have two uh, government sponsored loan types so far, FHA and VA. What's important to remember though, if you look back at 415, who do you get an FHA and VA loan from? You don't get an FHA and VA loan from FHA or VA you get it from a regular bank. So you're gonna to go to Wells Fargo, Bank of America, you know, One West, JP Morgan Chase, and that lender is gonna make you the loan. FHA and VA are merely going to insure or guarantee an FHA or VA loan made by an approved lender. Now, the third type of government-sponsored loan, if you look here at the bottom of 416 and the top of 417, is CalVet. CalVet is totally different than FHA and VA. On a CalVet deal, you're actually getting your loan from the state of California. The state is actually going out and buying the house for you and selling it to you on something called a land contract. So a land contract does not involve a bank. You might remember this from your principal's class. Remember, a land contract is also called a real property sales contract or an installment sales contract or a land contract. Not just for land, it's just there's no bank involved. The best analogy for this is if you were to go buy a car, like an old, you know, old kind of uh, crappy used car from a dealership, let's say it's $4,000. You could go to that dealership and tell them, look, I'll give you two grand as a down payment. Give me the car so I can go to work. Over the next year, I'll pay you $2,000 plus, you know, 15% interest or whatever it is, and you mail me the pink slip or the title when I get done paying you. There is no bank involved in that story. There's just the seller, the dealership, and the buyer on a contract. That's exactly how a CalVet loan works. The state goes out and buys the house for the veteran. 
The veteran signs a land contract. The state gives them the keys. The veteran gets to live there. The state, though, is going to hold on to a grant deed until the veteran pays off the contract price. This is a CalVet loan. So three government-sponsored loans that we need to know, FHA, VA, and CalVet. FHA and VA are different because the loans are originated by a lender. They're just insured by the government. On a CalVet product, the loan is actually originated. The deal is done by the state of California, and the state sells it to the veteran on a land contract. So two types of loans, conventional on one side, government-sponsored on the other. FHA, VA, and CalVet are over here, and the other loan types do not involve the government, and they're known as conventional loans. Now, another thing I do want to share with you from this chapter, if you look at 418 and 419, there's a few different vocabulary terms that are pretty important to know uh, for the exam. One of these is called an open-end loan or open-end trust deed at the middle of 418. An open-end loan is also called a home equity line of credit or an open-end loan. So in a home equity line of credit, also called a HELOC, the amount of loan is not necessarily predetermined. You're not actually taking any money today. They'll just give you, let's say, a $100,000 line of credit and you can draw on that line of credit over time. Now, these open-end loans, candidly, do tend to be adjustable rate loans because they kind of have to be, right? Because if a lender gives you a $100,000 line of credit today, the lender doesn't know what the cost of that money is going to be at the time that you draw or borrow on it. So the rate kind of floats maybe with Prime or with you know some LIBOR or some other kind of index, and the rate kind of floats around, and whatever the rate is will be what it is at the time that you draw, and it'll adjust over the life of the loan. That's called an open-end loan. How about the next one, a blanket loan? A blanket loan, this is where one loan is used to cover more than one parcel as collateral. So if I make you a $500,000 loan and you have three properties as collateral, if you don't pay me on that $500,000, I'm going to take all three. Frankly, I'm going to take all three houses. That's called a blanket loan. So a blanket loan is one loan secured by more than one parcel of real estate. Now, a blanket loan should have something called a release clause in it. And a release clause is basically a clause in a blanket loan that would allow for something called a partial reconveyance. Let me explain. Let's say you borrow 500,000 from me and we have three properties as collateral. Now, if you get that loan down to let's say 100,000, you might think it's unfair that you have three properties in jeopardy as collateral for a small $100,000 loan. So we could do a partial release clause where once you pay the loan down to certain milestones, the lender will lift up the blanket and take one of those properties and release it out from under the blanket loan. So two questions about this. Number one, one loan covering multiple parcels of real estate is known as what? Your answer, a blanket loan. A clause in a blanket loan that would allow for a partial reconveyance is known as a release clause, right? Usually once you get it paid down to some milestone. Look at the next one, a construction loan. Construction loan is also called an interim loan for the test. You might want to write that term interim. I-N-T-E-R-I-M, interim loan. This is a short-term loan made specifically for the period of construction. Now, these loans are generally made by commercial banks. You'll remember that from earlier. The lender that would most likely make you a construction loan is who? Commercial bank, right? Now, again, these loans are also called interim loans. Now, once you pay off or once you finish the construction, you know, construction loans, frankly, are kind of risky loans, candidly, because if you don't pay, that lender might be stuck with a half-finished project. Anytime you have a riskier kind of loan type, your rate's going to be higher. Once the construction is finished, you're going to want to get something called a takeout loan here at the bottom of page 418. A takeout loan is called that because it literally takes out the construction loan and the takeout loan sits as the long-term financing on the project. So now think about this for a second. When do you think it would be wise as a developer to get that takeout commitment from a lender? Oh, it's going to be wise to get that takeout commitment at the, frankly, at the same time you get your construction loan. You don't want to have your construction finished and have your construction lender tapping you on the shoulder wanting their money back and you can't get a takeout loan for the life of you. So you want to get that takeout commitment from a lender at the same time that you get your construction loan. Now, you may have to pay something called a standby fee. 
for the privilege of having that money parked for you over time, but that takeout loan commitment, frankly, should be uh, secured at the same time that you get your construction loan. Look at the next one, a package loan. A package loan is a loan, these are dirty sometimes because they combine both real property and personal property simultaneously. So if the collateral on your loan is like your house and your car, that's called a package loan. It's a loan that is secured by both personal property as well as real estate. Now, look at the last one here, bottom of 418 and the top of 419. You'll see the term wraparound trust deed. Now, a wraparound trust deed is also called an AITD or an all-inclusive trust deed. These were really big like in the 80s and early 90s. This is where, the reason it's called a wraparound or an all-inclusive trust deed at the bottom of the page is because if you're buying my house and I have a loan on it currently, you might secure a new loan. You'll leave my existing loan undisturbed and for the difference, let's say the loan is for 90,000, you're gonna buy my house for 120, you're gonna get another $30,000 loan, you'll get another loan that'll wrap around the existing first. So that first will stay on the title, this first will stay on the property undisturbed, and you'll get another loan that sort of wraps around, hence the term wrap around trust deed or all inclusive trust deed here on page number 418 and 419. Now, here if you look at the bottom or the middle of page 400, and oh, well actually, one thing before I forget, because this is important. You might hear that and say, well Karthik, you just told me that you are leaving the existing loan undisturbed and we're getting a new loan around it. So titles being transferred to a new borrower. Isn't that first bank gonna be pissed that you transferred title without paying off that existing loan? And yeah, they might. That's why these AIT deeds, AITDs or wraparound loans cannot have something at the middle of page number 419 called a due on sale clause in bold. A due on sale clause is a clause in a loan where if the lender finds out that you've sold the loan, or sold the property rather, that lender is gonna call the loan due. So if you try to leave my loan alone and you get a new loan around it and you just take a grant deed from me and that lender finds out, this is gonna trigger a what? A due on sale clause. So again, for a wraparound loan to work, the existing loan cannot have, at the middle of page 419, cannot have a due on sale clause. Also for the exam, this might be called an alienation clause, which is another term for due on sale. Now, if, if you look at the bottom of 419, you'll also see the term gap loan at the bottom of 419. A gap loan is also called a bridge loan. This is a loan between two projects. I'll give you an example of this. Let's say that uh, I have a, let's say I have a loan, uh, I have a house that's worth a million bucks and I owe 400,000 on it, right? So I owe 400, it's worth a million, I got 600,000 in equity, right? So I'm sitting pretty, life is good. I wanna sell my home and buy another house. It's possible that that next seller, the house I wanna buy, the guy selling me the house that I wanna buy might not wanna sit around and twiddle his thumbs or her thumbs waiting for me to sell, the, my, sell my house and get the equity to buy his. So I could go to a lender and get something called a bridge loan. A bridge loan is basically a loan where I borrow money against the equity in my current home, use that as my down payment for my next project or my next property, and the lender will be paid that bridge loan back when I sell the down leg. When I sell my existing home, he or she will get that money back. That's called a bridge loan. It's a loan against the equity in one property as a bridge to buy the next one. That's called a gap loan or a bridge loan. Now here at the bottom of 419, fixed rate loans. This is also something to think about. You know, especially today in 2014, 2015, rates are pretty low. You know, I, somebody sent me an, a, a video here of a, a, a great friend of mine. He's about 75 years old. Uh, he recorded a video on YouTube. Uh, I didn't even know he knew how to do that, but he recorded a video on YouTube and put it up and said, hey look, you know, today you might wanna take a hard look at adjustable rate loans, not fixed. Now I look at that, I, I listened to the whole video, I, in fact I watched it three times and it broke my heart because to give someone advice, a, a blanket piece of advice, that adjustable rate loans are the way to go, number one is not good no matter what the interest rate environment is. But number two, this notion that adjustable rate loans are good when rates are so low, I don't understand that because 
I might get an adjustable rate loan if, I, if I'm betting that rates are going to go down over time, right? If I think rates are going to go down over the next year, two, three years, I might look at an ARM or an adjustable rate loan because I'm betting that during the life of my loan, the rates are going to go down. It's hard for me today, you know, with rates at four and a quarter, four and three eighths, it's hard for me to look at this and chart out three, four years into the future and think to myself, you know, I think rates are going to go down over time. I don't think rates are going to go down. I think rates are going to go up over time. So anyway, an adjustable rate loan is something that might be good if, if, it's, if it's right for your personal situation or your personal set of circumstances. Now, another thing here, if you look at page 420, you'll see a 15-year versus a 30-year loan. Another thing to consider as you're you know, shopping for the right financing. Of course, a 15-year loan is going to result in uh, less interest paid over the life of the loan because you're chipping away at that principal a little faster. But your payment's going to be significantly higher on a 15-year loan than it would be on a 30. So that's also something to think about. 40-year loans at the bottom of 420. You know, 40-year loans kind of made a push in 2006, kind of at the height of the real estate market. People were saying, look, you know, prices are so damn outrageous. If we stretched out the loan term for 40 years, might this be better? Now, some countries, 40-year loans are common. Some countries have more than 40-year loans. You have this generational debt, right, where, you know, dad's house, so expensive. You know, uh, you know, son buys dad's house or son inherits that loan and they have, you know, longer than 40-year loans or daughter inherits that loan or whatever it is. But anyway, 40-year loans are something to think about because they do, uh, you know, slice your payment a bit because you're amortizing the loan over a longer period, of course. If you look at the bottom of 420, you'll see the term interest-only loan. Next to this for the exam, I would write the words straight note at the bottom of page 420. A straight note, now of course, in the industry, no one would call an interest-only loan a straight note. They'd call it an interest-only loan. But an interest-only loan is a loan that doesn't have any amortization, right? You're not actually paying down any of the principal. All you're paying is interest-only. That's, of course, known as a straight note or an interest-only loan. Benefit to an interest-only loan, pretty significant. Benefit is that you're going to have a lower payment. Instead of paying both principal and interest, in, a, in an interest-only loan, you're only paying interest, right? So necessarily and obviously, your uh, payment's going to be lower on an interest-only product. Page 421 at the top, kind of a historical concept here, an 80-20 loan. An 80-20 loan is uh, two loans for the entire purchase price. So you have an 80% loan on the first, a 20% loan on the second, and you won't be putting any money down. Now, one benefit to this, of course, is that you're going to avoid PMI or private mortgage insurance because you don't have any one loan greater than 80% of the value, right? You got an 80% first, you got a 20% second, and that's the extent of that's the extent of uh, the financing, right? So you're not going to have PMI because you don't have any one loan greater than 80% of uh, the of the value. Now, how about here at the bottom of 421? You'll see the term reverse mortgage at the bottom of 421. A reverse mortgage is called this because it's kind of in reverse. Instead of you making payments to the bank, the bank is actually making payments to you on a reverse mortgage. Now, you might hear that and say, well, how does that work? Well, first of all, you have to be over 62 in order to get a reverse mortgage, right? So you have to be you know, at least 62 years old in order to make this happen. You also have to have a decent amount of equity in your property. And then over time, either that, as an annuity, the lender is going to make you payments over time up to some limit, or you'll take a lump sum. And this really is for people that are a little older that are equity rich and cash poor. So that you don't have to make any payments and the loan is paid off either when you pass on or when your spouse passes on or, you know, a lot of, um, there's a lot of ways you can structure these, but it's called a reverse mortgage because instead of you making payments to the bank, the bank is making payments to you, cashing out a portion of your equity if you're over a certain age. So that's this discussion about adjustable rate loans. Now, one thing that we should look at here is at the bottom of 423 and the top of 424 and how adjustable rate loans kind of work and um, how the current rate is calculated. Now, basically how adjustable rates work are there's the lender generally sets something called a uh, margin and that's some spread over an index. Now, an index could be like the London Interbank Offered Rate, also called LIBOR. It could be the prime rate. It could be any rate. And then the disc the uh, excuse me, the um, margin is just added to that. You'll see this mathematically represented on page 424 at the top, 
we take the index plus the margin and this gives us our current rate, right? So index plus the margin gives us the current rate. So if the index is uh, currently at like, let's say 2% and the margin is at 2.25%, you're gonna add the index two to 2.25, which is the margin and your rate's gonna be four and a quarter percent. So what changes is not the margin. What changes and kind of bounces around that causes the overall interest rate to change, of course, is the, in, is the um, index. So as the index goes up and down, the margin gets added to that index and that changes your rate, which has an effect on your payment. Now, if you look here really quickly at page number 425 at the top, you'll see the term payment shock in bold at the top of 425. And perhaps this is appropriate because if your index starts going up through the roof, you're going to get potentially you're going to get some payment shock. Now, there are caps, though, in a lot of these adjustable rate loans. There's uh, lifetime caps on the interest rate. There's yearly caps or periodic caps. So this is an important thing to consider as you choose which loan you're going to get. If you are going to get a loan, you want to look at the index that it's an adjustable rate loan. You're going to want to look at the index that it's pegged to. Additionally, you're also going to want to uh, look at how that index has historically behaved. If the index tends to be super volatile, your payment could be pretty volatile, too. So that's payment shock here at the top of page 425. At the bottom of 425 and the top of 426, you'll see this discussion about some of these caps that I talked about earlier. The periodic cap at the top of page 426, which dictates the maximum amount that the rate could adjust in some period. Let's say it's an annual cap. And there's also a lifetime cap, right, that sets the lifetime limit that the uh, interest rate can never go over. So there's a periodic cap and a lifetime cap, both at the top of page 426. Now, at the bottom of 426 and the top of 427, there is also this discussion about uh, negative amortization. Now, amortization, as you might know, is where the payment causes the balance on the loan to decline. So every month you make a payment, your loan balance drops a little bit. Every month you make a payment, your loan balance drops a little bit, right? That's called amortization. Now, negative amortization is instead of the payment causing the balance to come down, in negative amortization, even though you're making a payment each and every month, the balance is rising over time. Now, if you think about that, you might say, well, that doesn't seem fair. That seems like some pretty funny math that you can make your payments each and every month and your balance could still rise. Of course, what's happening in a negative amortization product is that the payment that you're making simply isn't enough to cover the interest due. So maybe, uh, let's say, you see this sometimes with credit cards where maybe uh, I have a $4,000 visa balance and my credit card statement comes, they ask me for like 20 bucks. I'm like, man, this is pretty cool. I owe you $4,000 and all you want is 20 bucks from me. Here's your 20. Next month you get your payment or you get your statement. It says payment received $20, new balance $4,030. And you're like, hey, what the heck? I made you $20 last month and your, my balance has gone up 30. What's happened? What's happened there is that mathematically, the amount of interest that you owed that month was, let's say, $50. The difference between what you paid and what you actually owed simply gets added onto your loan balance, causing the balance to rise over time. That's called negative amortization. It allows you to owe a lot of money and only make very, very low payments. Now, if this sounds enticing to you somehow, it shouldn't, but if it does, or you can live in a big house in Beverly Hills and make a pretty low payment, you got to be careful because negative amortization at the bottom of 426, negative amortization is actually illegal. As of October 11th of 2009, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger at the time signed emergency legislation basically banning new negative amortization originations in California. So you couldn't get a negative amortization loan even if you wanted it today as uh, the rules currently sit. Now, um, if you look here really quickly at page number 428, What's important on 428, it says arm checklist. If you are going to take the risk of an adjustable rate loan, it is important to make sure that you thoroughly and fully understand how that adjustable rate loan works. What's the margin? What's the index that it's tied to? What effect are changes in that index gonna have on my overall rate and ultimately my monthly payment? All of these things are important at the top of page 428 to consider if you are going to get an adjustable rate loan. Now, one thing that's changed actually, this is very interesting over the last, let's say 20 years in underwriting, or underwriting of course is defined as the decision-making process as to whether or not you're qualified for a loan. 
One thing that's changed in the underwriting process on page 430 is uh, more of a shift to uh, computerized loan origination. This is where a computer will look at your credit and income and all this, and your computer will basically approve or deny the loan. So this is something that's pretty important to, uh, to just know that kind of there's a shift here. And a lot of people are saying that the uh, computerized loan decision-making process can actually or tends to be actually a more reliable predictor of default and risk than a manual underwriting process. Now, I don't want to be deceptive. A lot of larger commercial loans and uh, business loans aren't really going to rely so much on this computerized loan origination methodology, but it is, uh, it is semi-pervasive actually in our residential world. Now, if you look at page 431, this financing process, there are five steps to loan origination and ultimately servicing the loan. Look at number one, qualifying the borrower, looking at their credit, their income, their character, qualifying the property, right? Making sure that the property is not going to fall over. It's not riddled with termites, making sure that the appraised value of the property is enough to make sure we can do that loan. Look at number three, approving and processing the loan, a formal approval. Number four, closing it, getting the client to sign all that paperwork in the processing stage, and finally servicing the loan, making, uh, you know, collecting payments and making sure that uh, borrower is staying on track for the duration of the loan. Now, one thing that's important is if you look at qualifying the borrower and that concept on 432, one thing that we look at, of course, is the character of the borrower, looking at their late payments, any negative credit information, uh, amount of credit used versus the amount of credit available. Now, this is actually a commonly misunderstood concept in uh, underwriting, and that is, you know, uh, making sure that your available credit isn't maxed. So you want to try to keep those balances on your credit cards below like 50%, or some people say below a third of the total available credit due. So if you got that $1,000 credit card, try not to make that balance go up for any length of time more than, let's say, $400 right? Because uh, the way that the FICO system looks is if you're maxing out a lot of your credit cards, this might be an indication that there is an impending default, right? So that's important. If you look at the loan application on pages 433 through 439, uh, well, through 441, the font's a little big here. But one thing that I do want to show you in particular is on page 440. There is this section on page 440 about uh, ethnicity. Notice that it is optional. The ethnicity of the borrower, if I'm filling out this application on my own, I don't have to put my ethnicity on there. But really what's surprising to a lot of people when they look at this section in the book is they say, well, why the heck is this even on there? Why is it that every single residential lender in the United States, Wells Fargo in San Francisco, JP Morgan Chase in San Diego, you know, uh, TD Bank in Manhattan, New York, all of these lenders are using the exact same loan application. And all of them use a loan application that asks for your race. Now, a couple things here. First, it's optional. As a borrower, I do not have to specify my race. But the reason it's on there is for statistical monitoring purposes. I mean, if a bank got audited, I mean, think about this. Is it true that a bank has to make real estate loans in equal proportion to members of every race? No, that's not true. I mean, come on, if that were true, hey, a blue person walks in and says, hey, we've met our blue quota for the day. We need more purple people to make loans too. No, right? So that's, that's the lenders, it might sound good on the surface, but lenders don't have to make equal amounts of loans to members of every race. But we do have to make sure that we are not making loans on the basis of race, creed, religion, you know, familial status, etc. So if a blue person walks in with good credit and a red person walks in with good credit, we got to make sure that we're providing loan uh, terms regardless of ethnicity that are substantially similar. Now, what might be surprising here, if you look at the top of page 440, if this application is being taken face to face with the loan officer and the borrower, the loan officer, as it says at the top of 440, will actually have to make a reasonable guess based on your appearance and your surname as to what ethnicity you actually are. Isn't that crazy? That they're actually they're having to guess. Now, of course, this is to make sure that you know lenders are not discriminating. So again, if a lender were to be audited, we want to make sure that that lender is not taking into account, let's say, ethnicity or race in making a decision on whether or not to lend and on the terms under which we extend credit. 
Now, another thing that's pretty important as we talk about qualifying the borrower is here on 442 and 443. These are qualifying ratios when we talk about capacity. Capacity, of course, means like a debt to income ratio as it relates to capacity. Now, debt to income ratio, of course, as you probably know, is a ratio of the monthly payment to the borrower's gross income. Monthly payment to the borrower's gross income. So there are two ratios that we look at here. They are front end and back end. And we talked about this in an earlier chapter in real estate practice, but it's probably worth repeating here at the top of 443. Now again, remember both front end and back end ratios have to do with the borrower's gross income, not net income. So this is before taxes are taken out. The front end ratio is a ratio of the housing payment to the borrower's gross income. The back end ratio is a ratio of the borrower's housing payment plus other long term debt to the borrower's gross income. So if you have a borrower that you know, you're in the middle of an escrow and that borrower says, hey, look, you got to come see my new car. Now, remember, the escrow hasn't closed yet. You're still in escrow. And the borrower says, you got to come see my new car. I got a brand new Mercedes. Now, your heart's going to start beating you know, triple time here because you're worried that this is going to mess up not your front end ratio. Because remember, front end ratio is just housing to gross income. This is actually going to screw up your back end ratio. So again, the back end ratio is a ratio of housing plus other long term debt to the borrower's gross income. And this has to do with qualifying the borrower here on pages 442 and 443. The other thing that we're going to need to look at is if you look at 444 and 445, qualifying the property, collateral. The basic protection, of course, as you know, the basic protection that a lender has in the event that I don't pay is the actual property itself, right? Because that's the biggest risk that I don't pay them. The protection the lender has is the building or the house that I've put up as collateral. So we're going to need to get an appraisal done on the property to make sure that the property is worth what we think it's worth. Uh, the appraiser is going to look to see if there's any glaring uh, problems, big leaky roof or a bunch of construction being done. But of course, we have to qualify the collateral just like we have to qualify the borrower. Now, if you look at 446 and 447, a couple of important things on these two pages. One is at the bottom of 446, you'll see the term RESPA at the bottom of 446. RESPA, of course, stands for the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. And what's important to remember about RESPA, there's a few things. The first is that RESPA is going to require, middle of 446, something called a good faith estimate. This good faith estimate is originated by the lender and given to the borrower within three business days of you applying for a loan. So within three business days of you applying for a loan, RESPA says that the lender has to give the borrower a good faith estimate. Now, again, this isn't an estimate of your interest rate. It's not an estimate of your monthly payment. It's an estimate of the fees associated with the loan. Now, this only applies, as it says at the middle of 446, this only applies to residential one to four unit property. RESPA does not apply to commercial loans. So if you go get a, a loan to buy a big office building somewhere, or a 10 unit building, or you get a loan to buy some land somewhere, that lender is not required to give you a good faith estimate because who requires the GFE? The good faith estimates required under RESPA. RESPA only applies to residential one to four unit property. It does not apply to commercial loans. Another thing that RESPA prohibits, and you'll see this at the bottom of 446 with the term CBA or controlled business arrangement, RESPA prohibits something called a kickback. And a kickback is money that is given from a settlement provider, like a title company or an escrow company or a mortgage company, money given from that settlement provider to the real estate agent as kind of a bribe in exchange for uh, title orders. So a title company could not put their arm around you and say, hey, you're going to be a great real estate agent. Why don't we work together? For every escrow you give us or every title order you give us, we'll give you 50 bucks. Totally illegal, a violation of RESPA and a form of something called a kickback. Now, a lot of people ask, well, can I give money to my client? Can I give a rebate to my buyer? Can I uh, you know, discount the commission for my seller? You can do those as long as full disclosure is made because that money is not being given from a settlement provider to a real estate agent. That money is being given from the agent back to the client, right? So that's not considered a kickback. 
You could give money to an out-of-state broker or to a, to a California broker as a referral fee. That's not a kickback. A kickback, again, is money flow given from the settlement provider, escrow, mortgage, title, back to the real estate agent. That's a violation, of course, of RESPA. Now, this last section from this chapter, of course, that I want to talk about is here at the bottom of page 447, and it's predatory lending. Predatory lending is basically lending practices that essentially um, seek to strip a homeowner of their equity. The constant refinancing of an existing property. So you can ha add additional fees to kind of chip away at uh, what the equity is on the project. That's, that's a practice that's sometimes known as uh, flipping. Maybe packing, where you pack a bunch of unnecessary fees and costs in there and all these weird kinds of insurance. But as a, as a practical perspective, we should always be aware as borrowers and real estate agents dealing with lenders when we see signs of predatory lending. So that's here on 447 and 448.